even though this is our ninth uh, Kennedy Center book of the semester, an idea which I must credit to our general education and honors program, uh, we uh, have been thinking about having someone come and speak on uh, these issues of Islam and, and uh, contemporary politics in the Middle East uh, for some time. And perhaps it's owing to the fact that uh, it is a, a difficult part of the world to understand. Uh, there are many uh, complex and interconnected issues that it has taken this long for us to finally have someone come and speak on this topic. Uh, some of uh, the speakers who we had considered at one point uh, now appear, uh, their arguments appear to be much less uh, credible than they did, and, and, and it's, it's a very exciting and interesting time uh, to talk about these issues. These are also issues uh, that we aim in our book of the semester to reach a broad campus audience. We know here in the Kennedy Center we have a number of events that deal with, with uh, various international interdisciplinary issues, but uh, our aim with Book of the Semester is to cast a far wider net, to reach out across campus. For this reason, we, we make uh, copies of the book available to deans and, and administrators on campus, and also um, working with departments and faculty who would have a particular interest in bringing them to campus. Past authors have included uh, speakers as Joseph Nye, Jared Diamond, Jean Beth K. Elstein, Laurie Garrett, um, uh, and Philip Jenkins last, last uh, winter semester. And so we aim for kind of a broad uh, interdisciplinary international approach that will bring in uh, a core group of uh, faculty and students from different colleges and departments, but also that will appeal to a general informed audience. Um, I, I believe that there's something that everyone can like and also perhaps even take issue with in this book. We find this is an interesting book, but we really look forward to an informed faculty panel discussion to see what they think about it, and that's why we're here today. Um, let me just briefly introduce our, our four faculty panelists. Starting here at my far right, we have Glenn Cooper, uh, Assistant Professor of History. Uh, all, all, all these faculty are from BYU, as you probably know. Uh, at my immediate right here, Professor Bill Hamlin, Professor of History. To my left, Professor Daniel Peterson, Professor of Islamic Studies in Arabic and the Editor-in-Chief and Director of the Middle East Text Initiative. And then to my far left, um, Professor Becky Lynn Schultzeis, who's an adjunct professor of anthropology, and she is, quite frankly, the reason that we were able to bring in um, Reza Aslan. Uh, I'm not exactly sure of the connection. I believe a graduate school uh, connection as well, but in each of these events, we uh, appreciate the support of faculty in, in helping to uh, um, sort of speed things along, and, and she was the key person in, in uh, coordinating this visit and we're very appreciative to her for that. She will also, uh, from her seat, uh, moderate the discussion from here on out, so I'm going to slip out of the way. Uh, but we've asked our faculty members to each um, make an opening statement, and then um, we'll have time, hopefully, for them to discuss amongst themselves and then open, up, open it up for you. Um, we, again, want to thank faculty members for their time. This is uh, just one other thing that uh, has been asked of them, and. Uh, but we do value them for their, their perspectives and their time and the effort they put in in uh, preparing this panel. So thank you, and, and please join me in welcoming our panelists. <clears throat> well, I hope you'll indulge me as I uh, refer to prepared notes. It's that time of the semester. Uh, not to mention that time of life when uh, uh, you need these things, uh, cribs, as it were. Um, now, I'm, <clears throat> I'm a, a, a scholar of Islamic science, the history of Islamic science, so I didn't find much in the book that uh, exactly overlapped my, my field of expertise. Um, and in fact, I find, found the book to be somewhat flawed in the in the uh, area of history that I most deal with, namely the, the Abbasid period. Um, but I'm not going to pick at it. Um, that's not my purpose. What I'd like to do in my opening remarks is uh, discuss how I might use this book in a general education course, uh, of which I do teach. And I do emphasize Islam uh, in my world civil civilization classes. Um, <coughs> I mean, it, well, I, I will make a general historical remark, because I am a historian, and, and historians, if, if nothing else, we like to pick at each other's work. But um, he, does, he does skirt past uh, the 
the period of my interest. Um, and we find ourselves somewhat ahistorically leaping from the period of the Umayyads to the period of Al-Ghazali and the mystics and so on, and then leaping by leaps and bounds uh, through the modern period with little vignettes. Um, now, I know that, that the purpose of the book is different, as, as I'll explain in a minute, uh, but I did find uh, that somewhat vertiginous. Um, I had hoped to be able to engage him, and maybe I will when he's here in a couple of days, on issues relating to the history of science in Islam or uh, the attitudes of, of a civilization, of Islamic civilization in the modern period that has had a great history in uh, science. Well, what is the attitude today, uh, and so forth? Well. Now, for using the book in teaching, um, it's ac I think that its non-academically oriented historical character is precisely why it would appeal to uh, general education uh, students. I think it's a, it would be very useful as, a, as an introduction to Islam, as a culture and a civilization. I think that the author has presented us with an authentic account of Muhammad. Uh, by authentic, I mean a human one. Um, the tenderness with which he describes the trials of Muhammad, of Ali, and the passion of Hussein suggests something much more significant than mere history. Rather, this is a work of loving engagement with his Iranian Islamic tradition. And I, both of those uh, go together, those adjectives. Many passages in this book, as maybe you have discovered, were quite affecting and brought me, for one, to tears, especially those that described uh, Ali and his sufferings and his, his trials. Um, and Ali's been a personal favorite of mine among the early leaders of Islam, in, um, which is probably why it appealed especially. We have here an, a presentation of Islam in human terms and with Aslan's own ability to speak with a Western thought and culture, cultural dialect, he has expressed it in terms Educators, educated Westerners can appreciate. Note the, um, the glaring Yatesian uh, slouching toward Medina. And there are plenty of allusions to plays on Shakespeare, uh, to plays on Shakespearean uh, uh, tropes and other authors uh, that represent his American lit hum education, uh, which we might call general education. So Aslan in this book and in his other writings um, is a kind of cultural dragoman between Islam and the educated West. And the fact that he writes so well uh, aids his, his case. I think a work like this appeals to a universal human spirit. And it doesn't need to be strictly history. It's a religious history. And this is probably why it appeals so much to me as a, as a, a, a living believer. Um, it's a history that is relived and continually made present once again in the lives of the believers, just as he so lovingly describes the, the passion of Hussein and the suffering of Ali, the reenactment of the passion, uh, a particularly Sh Iranian Shiite thing, of course. And it's not hard to see parallels with the Christian mass and its redemptive effect on the participating believer. The truth of the story here that's told is not an academic truth. And so I would be disingenuous if I uh, critiqued it uh, too much in wearing my garb as, a, as an academic. But it is truer than true in the sense of a lived truth. It is a mythic, a mythic truth in the classic sense defined by Jack Lewis and Ronald Tolkien and discussed by them late one autumn Oxford evening nearly 80 years ago uh, when, when they discussed the Christian story and um, uh, Jack was was concerned the, about uh, uh, being a believing Christian and how, how it didn't seem, the Christian story seemed uh, to be too much of a myth. And uh, Tolkien uh, educated him and, and uh, suggested to him that the, the Christian story is a myth, but it's a true one. It's true because it, it is relived every moment, uh, every redemptive moment in the believer's life. And I think that the same appeal, the same applies to uh, the Islam that is presented in No God But God. Um, and I think it, for this reason also, uh, this book uh, in particular and Islam generally um, has a special appeal to a Latter-day Saint audience. Uh, the my mythic religious scenario that I have just described in my halting way is something that LDS people are particularly suited to resonate with. Uh, 
Uh, and it also suggests that Latter-day Saints may have a greater capacity to appreciate Islam than most Westerners. I refer to the most recent New Yorker article about Mitt Romney. Uh, it says that it characterized him as not wearing his Mormon religion the way Jack Kennedy wore his Catholic, his Catholicism. Rather, uh, Romney is a Mormon in the way that the Kennedys are Irish. Mormonism is a complete way of life, just as Islam. It's not a belief set, uh, which is a favorite um, Western post-enlightenment way to belittle religion, uh, i.e. religion is just a set of propositions that one can discard whenever something more intellectually appealing comes along. No, it is a complete way of life. It's a culture. It's almost, uh, Mormonism is almost an ethnicity. Um, Mr. Aslan's book gives us some, some of the sense of what it means not only to believe but to live the world of Islam through its sacred history and that I think is what makes it appealing to my students. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to say that this, I'm uh, quite pleased that this uh, book was written. I think it's uh, very important that Muslims today, um, moderate Muslims, engage uh, the radical view of Islam and provide an authentic yet uh, moderate alternative to uh, radical Islam that's, uh, you know, causing uh, numerous problems today in the world. And I find uh, Aslan's book very positive in that regard, and I applaud him for his work. I think his, his book has two major purposes, and the first is to introduce Islam to Westerners, that is, to, to non-Muslims. And part of his, his objective here is to undercut a lot of uh, negative anti-Muslim stereotypes that occur in Western media and Western uh, books about Islam in some ways. His other alternative uh, uh, purpose is to provide a, an alternative paradigm for Muslims for what he calls the Islamic Reformation. I think Becky's going to talk a little bit more about this in a moment. But um, a, a different way to, to be Muslim and be authentically Muslim and yet uh, have a religion that uh, is not involved in terrorism and jihadist efforts and things like that. And uh, I think the, the book at that level is uh, very effective and very positive. Uh, I, I think one of the problems is, uh, with the book is that in, that, in that second attempt, is that he essentially provides a fundamentally, he uses fundamentally Western forms of discourse. That is, he's a, an Iranian who fled Iran uh, just at the time of the revolution and then was raised in, in the United States and educated in Western universities. And his, his book uses kind of Western intellectual, uh, journalistic, scholarly uh, forms of discourse. And I suspect that those aren't going to be um, very well received by the jihadists that he's, in a sense, trying to convert to more moderate forms of Islam. Uh, they use a, d a different form of discourse uh, centered around tradition and, you know, traditional forms of uh, interpreting Islam and so forth. So, so there might be kind of a disconnect between uh, part of his purpose and its effectiveness at, at part of his target audience. Um, another interesting thing about the book is that I think it is a, a form of Islamic primitivism. That is to say, it tries to go back to Muhammad and use him as a model on which to reform Islam and, and then, in a sense, it, it doesn't ignore, but it plays down uh, all sorts of intermediate interpretations of Islam and Muhammad from the time of Muhammad up to the present and kind of uh, jump starts this into a, 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 this, what he calls this Islamic Reformation. Uh, it's interesting in that regard that in a sense uh, Mormonism does the same type of thing. I mean, it goes back to the time of Christ and says, you know, we, we're focused on the, uh, the, the New Testament and then kind of skips intervening, you know, 15... 1,700 years of, of Christian history, and then comes to the rest, Restoration. And in a sense, he's, he's trying to do the same type of thing um, for Islam. Uh, the other part of his, his uh, paradigm or his view of Islam beyond primitivism, that is going back to Muhammad himself as, as the model and the ideal, uh, the problematic thing with that is that in some ways the jihadists are doing exactly the same thing. And yet they are idealizing a different aspect of Islam, a different aspect of Muhammad's life. And, and they branch off in one direction, and the moderates are trying to idealize Muhammad's life in, in a different direction. And, and they're both 
looking to the same person as their ultimate model and yet come up with radically different ways to understand Muhammad in early Islam. So it's, it's pretty paradoxical that in a sense, uh, you know, Aslan's kind of moderate reformist attempts to deal with Muhammad are, are doing the same thing, that is looking straight to Muhammad as the model and yet coming up with an entirely different view of what uh, Muhammad meant. Uh, that, that's kind of paradoxical, but I think that's the way, that's probably what's going on here. I'd like to engage in, in the last couple of minutes uh, one core idea, and that is the issue of jihad. He talks about this uh, to some extent, and uh, he recognizes that jihad means many different things in Islam, and it means different things at different periods and to different groups within Islam. So it's uh, a very complicated idea that can't be dealt with in, in a few uh, seconds. He, he, uh, he grasps this and, uh, and engages that in his book, but I don't think he fully deals with the implications of jihad as an idea in Islam. Um, for example, he barely pa mentions the Arab conquests. I mean, you know, a couple of paragraphs in the entire book mention that. And that, those were a fundamental earth-shaking impact of Islam. And they're intimately tied to ideas about the nature of jihad. And yet he just kind of skips those. I mean, he mentions, a, like I said, in a couple of paragraphs. He also doesn't deal with apocalypticism in, in uh, the early Arab conquest and, and the implications of all of that as a manifest in book by David Cook and other scholars who, who deal with that. Uh, the fundamental problem here, I think, is that the Quran has, uh, says different things about how you engage with, uh, with non-Muslims and about the nature of jihad and, and struggle and fighting the path of God and these different types of ideas. On the one hand, there are, there are verses like, you know, uh, to you is your religion, to me is my religion, that, that uh, Aslan emphasizes. Uh, these are kind of a moderate approach to non-Muslims and how to, how to engage them. On the other hand, there's passages that say, you know, kill all the infidels wherever you may find them, uh, which, uh, in my understanding of the Quran, probably both of these are uh, kind of temporary things that uh, the Quran is telling Muslims to do, dependent on specific circumstances that they find themselves in Arabia. Are they at war with Mecca or are they at peace with Mecca? I mean, what's the situation? Well, what they should, how they should engage the people in Arabia at that time changes. And so the Quran has different ways to engage that. But that's not the way uh, the jihadists view it. They see the Quran as a, as a book that is talking to all people at all time. And so they decontextualize these passages. And they emphasize the, the jihadist passages in the Quran and then turn, turn it into a universal jihad. And Aslan takes the same Quran, emphasizes the pacifist parts of the Quran, and, and says jihad is defensive and you know, we have to get along with our neighbors and, and so forth. And both of those are, are absolutely there in, in the Quran. They're absolutely there in Islam. And, and yet, again, there's this paradox of turning to the same book, the same prophet, and coming up with radically different understandings of what the message, what the core message of, of the Prophet and the Quran was. And, and this is a problem that Muslims have to deal with. I mean, Westerners can talk about it and so forth, but, but Muslims are the people that have to deal with these issues. And I, that's why I think Aslan's book is so important, because here's a Muslim voice speaking for moderation, giving you a moderate view, the moderate interpretation of, of Islam. And, and that can only be uh, very positive. My fear is that there's going to be a disconnect, that the, they're not going to be talking to each other, and that Aslan will have an impact in the West and among moderate Muslims, but it's not going to really have much of an impact on the, uh, the radicals. Uh, let me say first off that I really like the book. Uh, it's very eloquent. It's uh, it's an interesting tract, and I, I, I use that word tract deliberately and without meaning to downgrade it. I think it's an important tract. It can be seen as, a, as, a, uh, as an argument launched out into the internal struggle, the reformation uh, of Islam that he himself talks about in his last chapter. He's taking out a position. It's a very, uh, uh, a very strong position, very clear lines, it seems to me. Um, I, too, was moved by his very humanizing approach to Muhammad, to Ali, to, the, uh, to various of the, uh, the, the early leaders of Islam, to the Shia movement. Um, 
there are a lot of things I liked about the book. In fact, uh, there were several, more than a few places where I thought, gee, I've, I've made that point. Um, and I guess one reason I like the book is that we agree on a lot of things. It reminds me of Ambrose Bierce's definition of admiration, which is one's polite recognition of someone else's resemblance to oneself. Um, <laughs> Uh, one of the things I liked about it was that it does, I think, uh, depict, although this is not his major goal, um, it does depict something of the intellectual and ideological and cultural variety of Islam. His, it's a point that he makes explicitly at the end of the book where he says that Islam has, is not and never has been a monolith. And I think that's important. Just today, uh, I, I seem to be a lightning rod for these sorts of things. I got an impassioned email from someone. Uh, saying that the reason that I'm interested in Islam, the reason Mormons have been friendly to Muslims, is that we share so many things, such as our oppression of women, our anti-intellectualism, and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, I love this sort of email. They just arrive out of the blue. But, um, but yeah, the fact is that the, the tradition of Islam, that the culture of Islam is anything but anti-intellectual, although right now we're in, in a period where uh, there are loud anti-intellectual voices. Um, uh, that I find profoundly unsympathetic. So I'm very sympathetic to his goal of trying to remind people of what's out there in the Islamic world, that there are other resources in Islamic culture that the model of Osama bin Laden hiding in the caves of Tora Bora is not the only model available to Muslims who want to, uh, who want to uh, uh, bring their faith, or have their faith come to grips with the challenges of modernity or post-modernity. Uh, he reminded me of things that I knew but had not thought about for a long time. I, in graduate school, I read a fair amount of people like Jamal al-Din Lafrani and uh, Muhammad Abdu, but I, it's not my primary interest, and I haven't looked at them in many, many years. And I have to say, I didn't much like them when I read them uh, years ago. They did nothing for me. Uh, now, though, through his lens, I could see, actually, they do have something to say in the current situation. I hadn't thought about them in all these years, and uh, they may be worth going back to again. Uh, Professor Hamblin mentioned that, that this uh, book will probably not be well received by the jihadists. My bet is they won't read it, or if they do, they'll read it only to condemn it and him. Um, but there is another audience out there, and I really do believe that in some ways the future of Islam will be determined not by people like bin Laden in Afghanistan, uh, and not even by uh, the Islamic Republic of Iran, but by what you might call the Islamic diaspora. Uh, people living outside of the, the heartland of Islam uh, in places like uh, Sydney and Los Angeles and New York and London. Um, and so this book is a very important contribution to a debate that I hope is going on intra-Islamically about what the true nature of Islam is and how Islam ought to relate itself to what might be called broadly and somewhat inaccur inaccurately Western civilization. Uh, I like Again, I like his, his idea of getting behind the traditionists, getting behind the Sharia as it was uh, elaborated uh, in the centuries after the Prophet Muhammad. Because, of course, as he points out, and what I think, uh, something that I think ought to have been obvious all these years, is that um, while a devout Muslim is required to believe that the Quran was revealed, it is not necessary for a devout Muslim to believe that all of the jurists functioning in the years after the revelation of the Quran were in fact divinely inspired. They were no doubt good and sincere people trying to spin out what they saw as the implications of the Quran, the life of Muhammad. But why should that role of spinning those implications out be limited only to the first three centuries and then the Babylon Jihad, the door of interpretation, closed thereafter when there are people today just as devout, just as learned, just as intelligent, uh, just as devoted to the Islamic cause, uh, but who have the advantage of living in our time. Uh, and living in the, the new circumstances that we face. Now, as I say, overwhelmingly, I like the book. Let me, let me quibble a bit. I think it's the duty of an academic to quibble whenever possible. Um, and so I will, not as much as I could, but just to pick up a few things that, uh, that strike me. Very small things at first. Uh, I, uh, I was a little bit put off by his description of the wealth and the status of Quraysh in, uh, in early, well, in, in the Mecca of Muhammad's lifetime. They were an important tribe. They were wealthy by the standards of pre-Islamic Arabia, but let's not overdo it. He talks about the unspeakable wealth of this tribe. Well, it was a, it was a primitive society living in mud huts around a brackish well. Uh, they weren't phenomenally wealthy. They wouldn't have been seen as phenomenally wealthy by anybody else, uh, say, in, living in Constantinople at the time or in, uh, 
in China. Um, when he talks about the ideology of the Hanifs, the, uh, the sort of pre-Mohammedan monotheists, it seemed to me just a little bit too much. Um, he was turning them into a kind of corporate movement, and I, that just it doesn't ring true to me from the sources. It was a tendency, it was a trend, it wasn't an ideology, it wasn't a formal movement of any kind, so far as I can see. Um, I was struck by the fact that in his very eloquent de depiction of the evils of Western colonialism, which may have been, I think, slightly overdrawn, the, the British come off as not much better than the Third Reich, um, that's a that's a bit much for my taste, but he does he does point to many of the evils that were done. The one quotation about the massacre of the sepoy rebels in India is perfectly blood curdling. I think uh, really appalling, uh, and it's in its giving of the Christian imprimatur to that just it's kind of sickening. Um, but you know it's striking to me that that by contrast he says nothing about what you might call Arab imperialism in the in the seventh, eighth, and ninth centuries. Um, this is a you know much more complex uh, historical situation than we typically uh, than is often recognized. Um, two more weighty things, um, and they're related. I think I was really put off, and I think everybody on the panel was, from what I understand, by his uh, by his comments about the relationship of religious belief and history in the introduction. Uh, let me just give you a flavor of that in case you haven't read this yet, which I hope you all have. Um, yes, he says, religion on, on Roman numeral 25, religion is concerned not with genuine history, but with sacred history, which does not course through time like a river. Um, and he goes on and on and on to say, to ask whether Moses actually parted the Red Sea, or whether Jesus truly raised Lazarus from the dead, or whether the word of God indeed poured through the lips of Muhammad is to ask totally irrelevant questions. Well, not to me. Uh, those are really, really important questions. Um, I understand this point of view. I don't, and I understand it from a certain point of view as, as being relevant. If you're doing only a kind of phenomenological study of the religion, you don't have to ask about the truth claims. But the most important question is the truth claims. I remember a, a very prominent non-Mormon historian of Mormonism who one night was sitting in my living room who, uh, who said, you know, he's just really sick of all these studies about Mormonism that concentrated on, on Joseph Smith as a prophet and did he really see an angel? Did he really, were there really gold plates? He said, none of that's important. That's not important. The really important things are questions like the origin of the ward system in Nauvoo. I'm sorry, I just find that absurd. Um, maybe it's a matter of taste. Um, but it seems to me the, the really big issues, the issues that grip human beings, are not questions about where the, where the ward organization uh, came from in Nauvoo and its relationship to city and municipal government or something like that. But did these things happen? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? That's kind of an important question to me. Um, and so I, I find this approach interesting, but, uh, but fundamentally this is one I think that will turn off a lot of Muslims. They say, you mean you don't think the truth of the religion is important? I think the truth of the religion is important. So do they. And properly they should. Um, I, those claims are hugely important. The, the, also related to that probably is his depiction of Muhammad as a reformer. Um, he says, uh, um, he's, he's arguing against those who say that Muhammad may have been influenced by his environment. Um, and he says, all religions are inextricably bound to the social, spiritual, and cultural milieu from which they arose and which they develop. Like so many prophets before him, Muhammad never claimed to have invented a new religion, which is true, but he distorts it when he goes on to say, by his own admission, Muhammad's message was an attempt to reform the existing religious beliefs and cultural practices of pre-Islamic Arabia. Well, no, not, not at all, uh, or not solely, or not largely anyway. Muhammad saw himself as restoring a, re a revelation that had been given before to earlier prophets. Um, he's not just there as a reformer of pre-Islamic Arabian religion. Uh, when he said he wasn't inventing a new religion, it would be like Joseph Smith saying, I'm not giving you a new religion, I'm restoring what went before. He would never have said, um, I'm just trying to restore the Methodism and the Baptist faith and the Campbellite faiths of my environment, and I'm just, you know, like Luther in his day. There's a difference between prophets and reformers. Uh, and in my own little biography of Muhammad, I actually addressed this quite eloquently, I think, although I can't remember what I said. Um, I, uh, I remember citing Max Weber and Geo Wiedinger and people like that to argue that, that there's a distinct difference here, that Muhammad is a prophet, not a reformer. Reformers are a different animal. They're a useful animal, but they're quite different from prophets. 
And so I objected to that. But I think, again, that's, that's relevant to his claim that, uh, that Islam is, is, is really not rooted in uh, the, the historicity, the historical factuality of its claims is not important. Uh, it's just the phenomenological character of the religion that has a certain structure and gestalt and so on and so forth. That's, that's important. For certain purposes, yes, but for ultimate human purposes, no, that's not the important issue at all. Uh, nevertheless, as I say, overwhelmingly, I liked the book. I, I wish for it a lot of influence, uh, not only in the West as an introduction to Islam of a peculiar kind, but more especially, I wish for its success within the Muslim community as an argument for a peculiar kind of Islam. Uh, one to which I'm quite sympathetic. Well, the benefit of going last means that I get to um, address things that I thought were relevant that previous people have not. And there's actually quite a bit of um, joy in that endeavor. Um, one of the things that I wanted to look at in Reza's book and that I found very, very interesting is the way he frames the whole thing. And as an anthropologist, and specifically as a linguistic anthropologist, I'm interested in form as much as content. So my particular response is probably going to be more along the lines of the form in which he takes his particular um, argument in the book itself. Um, and specifically, I'm going to look at it within the frame that uh, Professor Hamlin talked about of the idea of reformation and reform and how he looks at that. Um, mostly because I think that all writers um, position themselves in a text in some fashion. And I see Reza putting himself in the text in a very particular way by the types of themes that he chooses to look at and also by um, the ways in which, he, the mechanisms he uses to put that forward. As um, Glenn mentioned, his, the format of the book goes from very nice vignette to vignette so that you get bits and pieces of history, but it's more often couched in a story that illustrates a point for, um, for which he's trying to um, argue. Um, and one of the things I think that he does in the very beginning, um, briefly, which um, Dan has spoken about, is talk about religion and what it is and what it is not. And, um, there's a quote that I want to read from that in which I think he kind of puts forward his, his mode of dealing with these issues. Religion is not faith. It is the story of faith, shared and institutionalized symbols, myths, and rituals by which a community can share their experience with the divine. Now, when he's writing this book, what I found really striking were the symbols that he drew upon. Um, the symbols that he drew upon and the way that he drew upon them. In fact, he talks about prophets as being reformers who redefine and interpret the existing beliefs and practices of their communities, providing fresh sets of symbols and metaphors with which succeeding generations can describe the nature of reality. I see Reza kind of moving in that fashion. He's putting forward particular symbols in the ways that he deals with the idea of reformation and reform um, and how Islam can deal with that. Um, so one of the first things that I think he does is he situates himself as someone who is in the process of comparative religious study. Um, so he is dealing with symbols in that fashion. Um, and what's interesting is this idea of the analogy of the Reformation actually comes out of, ironically enough, comparative religious studies. Um, it began in the, the idea, the analogy that Islam needed to go through a Reformation or was in the process of a Reformation comes out of um, the late 19th century um, scientific study of religion, um, in which people were looking at events happening in the Middle East, most often Protestants looking at events happening in the Middle East, and drawing parallels between the kinds of um, movements that were occurring and things that had happened in Christian histor historical past. Um, so one of the first things that gets written about is the idea of the Wahhabi mu movement, um, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab in Saudi Arabia being a reformer, someone who is trying to get back to the origins of faith and um, belief. And that was actually picked up very early on um, by Protestant um, comparative religionists. And Reza deals with that issue when he says, you know, there are certain limits to the analogy of the Reformation when you're looking at it in the terms of Islam, because of course Christianity has a centralized had had has depending on your position 
a centralized authority um, that was being challenged through the Reformation. Um, and Islam doesn't necessarily, although there is a little bit of ambiguity um, as Reza deals with that in terms of seeing the ulamat, the jurists of the medieval period, as the great evil people who confined interpretation and made it so rigid that nobody could access it except the very, very skilled. Um, and seeing them as the ones who um, curtailed Islamic thought in moving in directions that could have progressed. Uh, but also seeing this as not being something that necessarily had to be reformed, um, as not a centralized authority that needed to be challenged. So there are some problems with the analogy in that regard. But there's also other issues. Um, one of the interesting things, one of the interesting ways in which the idea of reformation, um, Islam having to go through a reformation, is the way in which Muslims themselves have picked up this idea and talked about it. The first um, examples that we see of this trope of reformation um, and the parallel, the analogy between Christianity and Islam comes um, in the, by modernists at the very early 20th century in which they talk about the need for a Martin Luther, somebody who can take Islam out away from the ulama, the jurists, um, and make it more of an individualized process of interpretation. But what's one of the interesting things um, about that idea is that the original um, adoption of the um, Reformation analogy doesn't go the way that we generally think it does. Within the Christian adoption of the analogy, it's that Islam has to become more like Protestant um, Reformation ideas, moving away from um, its rigid, juristic positionality. Within Islam, they see Martin Luther as having moved Christianity closer to Islamic ideals of humanity, um, the fundamental goodness of humanity, and seeing um, this movement uh, of the Reformation as being actually getting them closer to the Islamic um, belief and practice. So it's, uh, it's interesting how the analogy has been used on both sides of the fence. And Reza kind of draws a little bit, he certainly um, sees himself as drawing on that tr tr tradition of the use of the idea of reformation, but he's definitely within the Western humanist tradition that has been mentioned previously in which the idea is that there needs to be a reform and it needs to occur in a way that decentralizes belief and makes it more of a personal uh, a personal practice and a personal interpretation. Um, one of the ways in which I saw that emerging in, this, in his presentation in the format was his discussion, as you mentioned, about the Quraysh and their, um, and their wealth and their status. And he, he really, um, it's, it was an interpre interpretation I hadn't seen before in which he talks about um, one of the things that Muhammad was in reaction to was the the process of sedentarization and economic, um, economic wealth and the accumulation of economic wealth had actually created greater divisions in society and greater status distinctions. And that people needed a reform, a reformer, to come along and help um, equalize the disparities that were existing. And I thought that was really interesting because that was in contrast to the tribes who were egalitarian, where no one was better than another person, the status was equalized. And I found that really interesting because I think that that's part of what his agenda is, is putting forth this idea that, that modernity has enhanced, our, our access to wealth has enhanced disparity and inequality, and that part of the process of reform is getting back to this idea of egalitarianism and um, distribution of wealth along more equal lines. And I thought that his, his depiction was symbolic of the kinds of reforms that he is advocating uh, in terms of his adoption of the model of Medina. So, um, and there are lots and lots of examples of that. And what I think is really interesting in the final analysis is that he al is not alone in calling for reform from a Western humanist perspective. Um, any of you who read the New York Times may have seen in recent years um, an article by uh, Salman Rushdie, the um, author of the Satanic Verses, calling for reform. Um, there's also been Thomas Friedman in the New York Times called for Islamic reformation. Uh, Farid Zakaria of the Newsweek has also been calling for a, a reform of Islam. 
And then there, there are also those who believe that the Reformation's actually occurred and what we are in now is an, a counter-Reformation. Um, that is the case of Ali, uh, I can't remember, Edraviz, who writes for The Guardian, um, who has argued that the reform actually occurred at the beginning of the 20th century and that what we're now in is a counter to that reformation that will lead us back to a more moderate view. Um, so there are lots and lots of positions on the issue of the Islamic reformation and Reza certainly situates himself in that um, and uses the book as a really interesting way of symbolically dealing with the issues that the reform movement is trying to deal with. All right, so um, would any of you like to respond? We've Bill? only got a few minutes left. Maybe we can open it to questions. Open it to questions. Do you want to open it to questions? All right. Um, can we have a few questions? Please, Amr. Um, I just sort of maybe just wait for the mic. No, we need to record it. All right, we need to record it. Just thinking about what you were saying on the whole issue of reformation. I just reminded myself that Reza is Iranian, and by saying so, he's also probably Shiite. Yes. And therefore, the whole issue of Reformation and a central sort of authority and so on and so forth is much more akin to Shiism than perhaps Sunnism. So when he thinks of reform and the Protestant Reformation and, and sort of in terms of having a central authority that needs to be th reformed, that would certainly fit more in with how Shiism operates and the, 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 the idea of you have ayatollahs and you have supreme ayatollahs who are almost infallible but not quite as infallible as perhaps the uh, Mahdi himself. Um, so per that might explain why he's following that path or why that becomes more applicable to him? It, it might because there are a number of um, Muslims who are calling, modernists who are calling for reformation and draw upon that who are Iranian and of Shia extraction. But however, um, they're not alone in that. There are a number of Sunnis who also call for that kind of thing. So it's. But uh, is, I would think there. It's it's probably slightly. If they come from different um, sides of the fence, I suspect. Probably. You know, in terms of what, because if you think even of uh, your uh, fundamentalist sort of more radical movements, they're also calling for reform, but their own version of reformer a sort of a, a fundamentalist going back to the straight path, going back to the original form. And uh, as opposed, to, and, and even if you compare those to the modernists of the early 20th century again. Um, well, and that goes to what um, Bill mentioned earlier about the fact that you can have the same, same information and take very different takes on it. Um, yeah. you can I just think we, we need to make sure we understand that Rez's reform relates um, I, I would I would say that that's that how I read it anyway it does relate in some respects but at more the same time Shiaism. he um, is not as tied to Shiism as you might think oh, okay I don't know him personally I'm yeah. thinking because maybe I'm thinking of Sarush as well and and he draws on Sarush but, yeah. but not in holy and okay. completely he does draw on other people as well right, Shahrur, he, he yeah sits, well Shahrur, yes has an extended um, yeah. discussion of Shahrur, so okay all right thank you mm -hmm. Um, this question is for you, Professor Peterson. Um, you mentioned that one of the things you disagreed with was Reza's way of seeing the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him, as a reformer. Um, but wouldn't you think that, um, I mean, most Muslim leaders today in the world see the Prophet Muhammad as a prime example of a reformer of community and politically. So if we can't see the Prophet Muhammad as a reformer, what does that entail to Reza's idea of reformation in Islam, being that the Prophet Muhammad reformed, I mean, the entire Arab community, gender roles, social structure, even military, the concept of military and the unit, the ummah, you know, that, that's, uh, I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's the danger of uh, sort of shorthand talk in a very, very brief response. Um, I don't mean to say that he was not a reformer. I mean to suggest that a prophet is a reformer plus. Um, so yes, did he reform society? Absolutely. It's the most drastic reformation that Arabia ever underwent, one of the most dramatic, dramatic reformations ever anywhere in human history. But, but uh, I objected to 
to the author's approach to him as simply reforming the customs of, of pre-Islamic Arabia. I think Muhammad himself would not have seen himself as merely that. He was a prophet. He was restoring truths given to Adam, Noah, Moses, so on and so forth, Jesus. Um, uh, and, and so to describe him as simply coming in with a kind of uh, reformation of the customary material that was there, uh, drawing on the material simply in his environment. This is something I think a Muslim, most Muslims would not approve, uh, that he's actually getting revelation from God. He's not simply reshaping the symbols of his environment, forming a new, uh, a new uh, amalgamation of those things there. So that's why I wanted to say a prophet is probably or often is a reformer, but much, much more than that. Martin Luther is a reformer, but not a prophet. Uh, a prophet, Jesus, Muhammad, so on, will be a reformer, but more. Yes, you uh, kept going back to the idea of jihad, and um, I think um, for most Muslims, jihad is not so much a, at least jihadists, as you referred to them, are not so much religious people and their religious arguments don't really sell there. What really sells is their political argument and if they go back to history, they would usually go back to the history of the last 50 years. Uh, not, not any further than that. So how, I mean, I, I think that if people actually even support them, uh, what they support is their political arguments, not so much their religious arguments. So how, how do you reconcile the two? I, I think that's absolutely right in many ways. Um, from my perspective, however, I don't think there's a difference between politics and religion in the jihadist point of view, that they're intimate, they're the same thing. I mean, they're intimately connected together. I think the the issue is that there's a whole bunch of different ways that jihad is interpreted, and although they have a political agenda, they use jihad ideology to try to further that agenda or, or one type or aspect of jihad ideology. So I think you're absolutely right. The, the, the jihadist movements have lots of different goals and lots of different things they draw upon, but ideologically speaking, jihad or their view of jihad is, is one of them, an important one. Kind of the idea. Anyway, it's not the only thing, but it's an important part of what they're doing. 